Mahaban wa ahlan bakum fi baranamij dakal Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum Robert Satloff. El waka'iya mukabil el mithaliya. El inizaliya mukabil el umumiya. America umma la yumkin el izdikhna anha mukabil America awalan. Abadan lan yaktuth mujadadan mukabil to janib el tashabukat el kharijiya. Havihi baad min amak el munakashad el daira fi madmar el siyasa el kharijiya el amerikiya. Well, kefiat aleti yajma abiha el reis bain havihi el anasir fi siyasatihi el kharijiya tahadid mukanat amerika fi al alam wa liha taathir kabir al salam miliorat al bashar wa amnihim. Robert Lieber, wahid min kibar ulama amerika el siyasiyin Yutmin an el reis Obama kad akhfak fi tawali el masuliyat el asasiyya le kiyadat Amerika fi al alam. Wa kataba qailan an el reis fadala el khusum al el khulafa. Wa taraja'a an el iltazamat. Wa rafada istikhdam el kuwa hatta an el darura. Wa yasuk el hujaj al el an el natija alam akthar khatura Mima ken kabla thamenia awam. Hel stad liber al-haq. Hel nakhnu akal amnan. Wa akal salamatan. Wa akal akhtaraman. Amma kunna kabla tawali Barack Obama lil riyasa. Am anana sanaud lil nandur ilil walayat Obama. Ala anha wak aadna fihi muwazina daur Amerika fil alam muwazina sahiha. Lamunakasha hadihil asila el muhima, ya surni anu rahib, be Robert Lieber, estad el shu'un el hukumia wal dawliya el marmuk fi jami at Georgetown. Welcome back to Dachel, Washington. I'm sitting here with Professor Robert Lieber to discuss American foreign policy under the presidency of Barack Obama. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much. So, I think it's fair to say that you're not a fan of President Obama's foreign policy. Why? Not at all. The reason why is that America has played a leading role in maintaining world order, prosperity, and peace for most of the last 70 years, really since the end of World War II. President Obama came to office with a view that everything about American foreign policy was related to the 2003 war in Iraq. Well, there were problems with that war, but it's not the sum total of America's world role. Instead, the president has spent much of the last eight years pulling back, retrenching, disengaging from American commitments, especially in the Middle East, but also in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. I argue that that has been harmful to regional stability to peace, to prosperity, to human rights, and it has allowed uh, countries that are our adversaries, that are aggressive toward their neighbors, to make inroads in their regions. I think of Russia, China, the Iranians under the mullahs, and others, when the American presence was still very much to be desired. So just, just to be clear, um, it's not your view, if I understand it properly, that the president has just made a couple of mistakes. Your view is he actually has a strategy which is wrong for America. Right. The president, critics of the president have sometimes said, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing or he's made these mistakes. Um, I would say that's not the best way to understand President Barack Obama. He came to office with a very clear notion in his own mind about American foreign policy. In my view, that notion was deeply mistaken. It was a notion that by pulling back, by retrenching, uh, that the United States would become safer and more secure, and the, would, the world would be more prosperous, more peaceful, more stable uh, at the same time. I think those assumptions were deeply mistaken, and the evidence is that uh, that's exactly what happened. Um, is there any region of the world that you can look around and say, well, America is better off in that part of the world today than we were eight years ago? No, I don't think so. Um, I wrote a, a recent 
uh, essay in Foreign Policy in which I argued that contrary to what Vice President Biden has said, claiming that we are safer and more secure now than when he and the president took office in 2009, the opposite is the case. If you look at the Middle East, with at least four countries in the midst of chaos and civil war, or you look at East Asia, where China has made enormous inroads, seizing territories and uh, uh, oceanic areas in the South China Sea and threatening its neighbors, or you look at Iran, which our own State Department says is the world's principal state supporter of terrorism, or you look at Latin America and the uh, appalling treatment of human rights in places like Venezuela uh, and Cuba, uh, against which the U.S. has done basically nothing, I think it's fair and accurate to say that the record shows the world and our own national interests are worse off as a result of this pattern of retrenchment or retreat. Now, j just so our viewers can have some of the context here, um, apart from the academic <coughs> strength of your argument, uh, you're not a uh, card-carrying, long-time member of the Republican uh, foreign policy establishment, is that not, right? Not at all. In, a, in past years, for many years, until a decade or two ago, I was very active in democratic foreign policy matters. I was a foreign policy advisor in several presidential campaigns and so forth. But I think, uh, alas, and I would describe myself as a political independent at this time, um, alas, uh, the current in the Democratic Party, which I would describe as Truman Democrats or Jackson Democrats or even Joe Lieberman Democrats, uh, no longer exists. And I don't think there is sufficient recognition of the importance of American policy and power in advancing the interests of democracy, human prosperity, liber liberty, and stability around the world. It's a myth that if we pull back, quote, other countries will step up. The latter were the words of the president. The role of the United States is critical in most areas, and its absence has been harmful. Well, what's wrong with, with one of the core arguments that the president and his advocates have made for, um, from the beginning, mm -hmm. which is he was elected to end wars, not to fight them, and to focus on building at home, even nation building back at home. What's wrong with that? Well, the president specifically said that he wanted to do nation building at home, and he wasn't the only one. The American public was tired of two long wars, one in Afghanistan after 9-11, that was authorized by the United Nations, the other in Iraq uh, in early 2003, which was a, a fateful choice by the administration of George W. Bush. The public clearly wanted to get out of Iraq and was tired of the war in Afghanistan. The problem was not just how you get into a war, but how you get out of one. As the Soviet revolutionary leader Leon Trotsky once said in a widely quoted set of words, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. It takes two to end a war. You can't just say, well, we're going to stop. In the case of Iraq, the country was essentially stable when the Obama administration withdrew, withdrew all of our troops at the end of 2011. And the president and vice president even praised the stability of Iraq with an elected government and said we would work with them to achieve wonderful things. But the nature of the withdrawal, which was precipitous, overly hasty, helped to create conditions in which Iraq came apart very quickly, both in terms of the brutal and repressive actions of President Maliki and in terms of the loss of support of the Sunni population and the rise of ISIS, whose predecessor, uh, predecessor al-Qaeda in Iraq had been defeated by the surge led by the Sunni awakening mo uh, movement and supported by U.S. forces in prior years. So uh, just to finish the, the critique, would, would it have been wiser in your view 
And would we not have the whole ISIS challenge today if American troops were still, had, had never left Iraq, or at least um, a large, uh, significant force of American troops had stayed in Iraq? Sure. Foreign policy is always made in the midst, <coughs> excuse me, of imperfect information and uncertainties about the future. That's fair enough. But had we left a modest number of forces there, perhaps 10,000 troops, not as fighters, but for logistical purposes, for intelligence and reconnaissance, and for pro providing essential functions, and also to signal to all of the peoples of Iraq, including the Sunnis, that we are there to help keep, keep things stable so they won't be repressed. I think, and many regional experts think, it would have made a difference. Instead, as a consequence of this, Barack Obama has been forced to reintroduce troops into Iraq. This was after the fall of Mosul. Um, and to be the fourth American president in a row to commit American forces to Iraq. Had he withdrawn in a more careful way, pulled back gradually, without cutting and running, I submit that we would have had, the Iraqis would have had a more decent, stable situation than they do today. Okay, when we come back, we're going to ask Professor Lieber if this dark picture that he has painted of American foreign policy as of 2016 is repairable by whoever gets elected in November. Robert J. Lieber is Professor of Government and International Affairs at Georgetown University, where he has previously served as Chair of the Government Department, Interim Chair of Psychology. In addition, he chairs the Executive Committee of Georgetown Center for Jewish Civilization. He is author or editor of 17 books on international relations and U.S. foreign policy, the newest one of which is this, Retreat and Its Consequences. American Foreign Policy and the Problem of World Order. You can get it on Amazon. In his stellar career, Bob Lieber has been an advisor to presidential campaigns, to the State Department, and to the, draft, the, to the drafters of the U.S. National Intelligence Estimates. He has also taught at Harvard, Oxford, Paris, and Shanghai. A native of Chicago, he received his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin and his doctorate at Harvard. So, Bob, just before I ask you about the future, one more question about mm -hmm. the president. How would you assess the core responsibility of Commander-in-Chief, namely to keep Americans safe, here at home especially? Absolutely. But the question is, are we safer now than we were eight years ago? Certainly, our uh, military forces, the Department of Homeland Security, um, and all the extensive things we do to try to protect American citizens are very effective. Um, but it's also the case that Al-Qaeda and ISIS represent threats to the, not only the peoples of the Middle East and North Africa and the sub-Saharan regions of Africa, but to Europe and the United States. And the threat from Al-Qaeda and from, especially from ISIS is significantly worse today than it was eight years ago. All right, you, you've, you've painted a pretty gloomy picture here. Um, is this beyond repair? It's not beyond repair, but also I want to say it's not confined to the Middle East. When President Obama in 2013 abandoned his red line, his statement of a year earlier, that there would be grave consequences crossing the red line, if President Assad of Syria used chemical weapons, when he abandoned that at uh, Labor Day that's in early September 2013, it sent a shock around the world, not just in the Middle East and Syria, but uh, among America's allies and friends, there was deep disappointment. Among America's adversaries, Putin and the Kremlin, Xi Jinping in Beijing, the mullahs in Afghanistan, they said to themselves, this is not a man who America's friends and allies can count on, and this is somebody, this, is, this tells us we can be more assertive, even aggressive, 
in our neighborhoods. And that's exactly what happened. Putin's adventures in invading Crimea and eastern Ukraine, Xi Jinping's actions in the South China Sea, the fact that the Iranians, despite last year's nuclear agreement, are just as aggressive vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors in the Middle East and are still the world's principal state-supported uh, backers of terrorism tells us that American policy under Obama has been harmful, not just to us, but to others. So how would you fix it? Can, uh, fix can it? any new president come in, um, restore a sense of confidence among the allies, reinstill fear among our adversaries, and, and fix everything you've just outlined? In principle, definitely, yes. Um, four years ago, I wrote a book about American power. It was called Power and Willpower in the American Future, in which I said that talk about American decline was greatly exaggerated. Even today, with the problems we have, which are modest, frankly, not severe, the capacities of the United States, by all the indica indicators through which we measure power, population, technology, economic strength, resources, energy, military capacity, entrepreneurship, research universities, and on and on, are unparalleled in the world. But the problems are then are not at the material level, they're at the ideational level, at the level of ideas and leadership and policy and resolve. An American president who understands this in the future will have the material capacity, the basic underlying strengths of America to rely on to reassure our friends, deter our adversaries, and if worst comes to worst, defend against threats to them and us. I, mean, I hate to be blunt about it, but are you suggesting that, that uh, does the next president have to display some force? Does he have to use force somewhere to convince people that he's for, he or she is for real, or words alone will suffice? It's a combination of diplomacy, language, and power, however defined. One of my criticisms of the Obama administration is that all too often it says, you either have to do what we say, or else you're going to fight World War III, or else you're going to fight another Iraq war. That's completely wrong. The choices are far more complex. There are so many more things you can do that involve diplomacy, geopolitics, economics, finance, information operations, covert activity, uh, support for others, material support, uh, defense support, air power, and so forth, before you put boots on the ground. The key idea here is that power and diplomacy are reinforcing. Diplomacy without power is impotent. Power without diplomacy is blind. My argument is that the administration's diplomacy has been weak and ineffective because it has not been backed up by power, and it, that does not mean you've got to put boots on the ground everywhere. And as you, uh, um, as you view the American presidential election from your perch at Georgetown, does this give you any confidence that, uh, um, that whoever may win will be able to repair the problems you've outlined? All I can say is that this has been an unusual, unprecedented election year. And I'll quote the late Labor Prime Minister of Britain, Harold Wilson. Wilson once memorably said, a week is a long time in politics. Anyone who tries to make predictions about how the election will play out and what will happen in American politics when the next president takes the oath of office on January 20th, uh, 2017, is any such prediction is fanciful at this point. Fair enough. But I do want to ask you just a broader question. President Obama tried to get America out of the Middle East in terms of fighting, and in the end failed. And we are still fighting wars, albeit at a much lower level, but we're still fighting two, or two and a half perhaps. Should Americans get used to the idea that in some fashion uh, we will be engaged in Middle East conflict as far as the eye can see? The president claimed in his interview with Jeffrey Goldberg in April that the Middle East was no longer very important to us. In my judgment, that is completely wrong. If you look at a list of all of America's national interests in the region, 
avoiding control by hostile powers, supporting friends, uh, regional stability, uh, nuclear nonproliferation, democracy promotion, uh, and uh, combating terrorism. All those, almost all of those interests, except perhaps for the supply of oil, have been badly jeopardized by the actions of this administration. The Middle East matters not only to us, but to the people of the region. Um, stability, peace, prosperity, liberty are important to all peoples, and the United States has an important role in supporting with others these things. American leadership is crucial. Bob Lieber, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Washington. Inside Washington at elhura.com. Ma'akum, Robert Satlov. Shukran lakum wa ila lakah.